please stand for our nation's national anthem. Morning, Family Life Church. It is so good to see all of you here this morning. Stand with us as we get this worship service started. Who's ready to celebrate their freedom this morning? Scripture says that we're the spirit. Break into the wild and don't be afraid. We run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Oh, dance like the weight has been lifted, graces waiting. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here. Let there be freedom. Let there be freedom.
shake at the sound of Jesus name oh lives made whole hearts awake at the sound of Jesus name chains will fall prison shake at the sound of Jesus name oh lives made whole hearts awake at the sound of Jesus Let's give the Lord another hand praise this morning. You know what's great? That we are in a country that we can come freely and worship God. And because of what they did 200 years ago, (laughs) we have the 4th of July, amen? And we can have freedom to worship God our God. Amen. Amen. Well, we just want to give a hand praise. Give the Lord a hand praise for all our first time guests. We want to say thank you for joining us today. And for all of you that have joined us as a first time guest, we do have something called a connect card and it's in the back of every seat. We would love for you to fill one out, bring it over to our next steps table. And we just want to thank you for being here. Amen. Also, we want to thank the Lord for all you that have been coming here and have been a part of Family Life Church. And if you believe that God has called you to serve here in this ministry, we have Connect Point. And if you want to learn more about our church and where God would want you to serve here and be planted, come join us. I believe the next one is next week. And um, you can sign up at the next steps table at the conclusion of service. And and that's just another way of giving, you know, because you're giving of your time. But at the same time, we can help you search what God has placed within you to be a gift to the church. Amen? Amen. 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 But there's other ways of giving. So we have two other ways of giving. You can give the old way, you know, by putting a check in in an envelope and going to the between those two doors as a drop box. Or the way that I like to do it. I like to be in the privacy of my own home. You know, because, you know, we know that everybody here gives like, you know, five, six thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars at a time. So, you know, you don't want people seeing, you know, you don't want people seeing how much you're giving. So if you go to OcalaFLC.com, I'm just joking about that. They're like, oh my goodness, they want thousands of dollars in this church. (laughs) So what we're gonna do is um so that what 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 that does, it helps us be able to connect with others and and share the gospel across just not in Ocala, but all the cities that need us, amen, that need to hear the voice of God, that need people like us that love up on people. How many people love coming to this church? I mean, the love of God is shed. 
in this church, and there's nothing but love. But if you want to be part of that, um, the Bible says when you give, when you give, amen? So that's something that he wants us to do to continue spreading his gospel, amen? Who, who wants to continue worshiping this morning so we can continue giving God grace, his, his great love, amen? Let's give the Lord a hand praise, hallelujah.
the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God Moses, the one who opens up the ocean. you now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. Come on, shout it this morning, because I may not face Goliath. prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same God you were providing then you are providing now you are the same God you are the same you move in power
danger here that we worship you, Lord, the same God. You have freed the captives and you are freeing hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. We feel you, Lord. You're here, oh Lord. And you're the same. You're the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty river, come and fill me again. Come on, let that be your cry. Lord, and fill me again. So won't you fill me again? Come on, can we just maintain the spirit of worship? I want to invite you, just get in a place where it's just you and God. It's not about the people around you. Right now, it's just you and God. Can we make that declaration in our hearts that we believe our God is the same God who acted for those people in the Bible, that he is the same God who acts on our behalf as well? And can we just invite that Holy Spirit, just like the end of that song said, Holy Spirit, come and fill me again. God, allow us to feel your presence in this room. Allow us to leave here today being able to know that your tangible friendship and your love is evident in our hearts. So God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. You are the same God as Jacob. You are the same God for Mary. You are the same God for Moses and David as you are for here today for us. And so God, we give it all to you. And Lord, as we get ready for today's message, we open our hearts and say, God, we know that you are a God who wants to change us from the inside out. And so we open our hearts all of our doubt, all of our fear, all of our anxiety, we give it to you so we can hear clearly what it is that you have for us today. It's in the precious name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. Cool deal. Let's give God a shout of praise one more time, y'all. Cool deal. Find someone sitting near you, tell them it's good to see them in church, and you may have a seat. Thank you, worship team. All right, all right, man. Well, hey. Welcome to church. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors here. And for all those watching online, we're so glad that you could join us as well. Man, didn't those teenage boys do amazing on that anthem to open up service? That was awesome. Well, cool. Well, hey, um, before we jump into today's message, um, I want to just have you share in my joy. So here at Family Life Church, the people who serve on our, on our volunteer team, we call it the dream team. And, and we love to have fun. Like, we love, you know, and if it wasn't for the dream team, guess what? We just, like, close our doors. We'd be done. You know, our dream team is, 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 you know, God is the backbone, but the dream team is like the skeleton built on God that helps the mission here at Family Life Church move forward. And I just want to share a clip with you from last Sunday night. We celebrated our dream team. We have a dream team party twice a year. Check out this clip right here. I'll tell you, man. Man, you may be thinking these people need to go back to pre-K. They don't know how to put a t-shirt on. But actually, what's going on, these are frozen t-shirts. They were frozen in water, and they had to literally rip them apart <laughs> and get them on. <laughs> yeah, that, man, that's a crazy bunch of people right there. <laughs> 
No, man, we, we like to say that those who serve get the best seat in the house. And, you know, we believe that God wants us on the field. And so I just wanted to show you that and, and celebrate with you guys. And thank you to all the Dream Team members who serve week in and week out to continue the mission here at Family Life Church. Come on, can we get up our Dream Team? Now, listen, as a reminder, um, if, you know, we talk about it every single week, but if you know this is the church you want to be a part of and you want to plug in and start using your gifts to spread the kingdom of God here through Family Life Church, go through Connect Point. We do it once a month. We have our next Connect Point next Sunday from four, at 4 to 6 p.m., and you can let us know you're coming at the Next Steps table. And listen, if, if you haven't served in a long time and, and you're ready to get back on the Dream Team, just come hit me up. We'll get you back on the team. But hey, let's get into today's message so how many people have had fun the last few weeks of been looking at the series in the life of Joseph? I mean, I've been enjoying it, the research. I've been learning so much. It's been really enlightening for myself as well. And, and today we're going to be bringing it to a close. Yeah, that's the part where we go, aww. <laughs> no, but we're going to be bringing it to a close today. And, and if it's your first time here, you know, just think about the title, Down But Not Out. You know, what, what's the image that you get? You know, for me, it's the image of a boxer going into the match. If you've ever walks, if you ever watched boxing, you know how it is that over the course of the rounds, I mean, those boxers, they just lay into each other. And a boxer can just take pounding after pounding. And, you know, you think about how life is. Have you ever noticed how life can be like that? It just feels like one pounding after another pounding, a right hook, a gut punch. And just like in boxing, sometimes the pounding can get so much that you find yourself on your back looking up. You've been knocked down. And God promises us, God warns us and tells us that all people, both the righteous and the unrighteousness, that you will face challenges and trials in your life. But just like Rocky Balboa, when life knocks you down, God wants to remind you that you are not out. So what we've been doing with this series is we've been looking at the life of a man named Joseph from the book of Genesis. And when you look at the life of Joseph, you see a man whose life was literally a roller coaster of ups and downs. It was incredible. You know, in week one, we learned how Joseph started off on a really good note. I mean, he grew up in a wealthy family, very prominent family. He was the great-grandson of Abraham. His, his father loved him dearly, but Joseph said some not-so-smart things to his brothers. And his brothers hated him so bad that they sold him into slavery. You want to talk about being in a pit in life. But... He kept his faith in God, and he was bought by a man named Potiphar in Egypt, and Potiphar gave him opportunity to rise, and Joseph showed that he could be trusted and kept his faith in God, worked hard, and Scripture says that he became successful. And in fact, he became the head servant over the entire household of Potiphar. So he goes from being at rock bottom, and he's finally getting his life back on track. But then Potiphar's wife lied about him. Has anyone ever had someone lie about you? That sucks, doesn't it? The pain from someone lying about you. And next thing you know, Joseph finds himself now not only as a slave, but a prisoner. And now Joseph finds himself right back on rock bottom. But he kept his faith in God. He lived in faith and not doubt. And he started becoming successful again to the point where he was put in charge of the entire prison. And then it happened. An opportunity came, as we talked about last week, where he was promoted to the number two guy in the entire Egyptian empire. But Joseph had to go through what we call blind sides. Look at your neighbor say, blind side. He had to go through a few blind sides. You and I, we're going to be blindsided by life. Now, what is a blind side? In your notes, a blind side, by definition, is simply a direction of which a person has a poor view. Now, how many, how many football fans we got up in here? I know I'm not the only one. Yeah, quite a few. Do you know what a blind side is? Let's go ahead and show a video. This is a great example of a blind side. Oh, that's the best college football team in Florida right there, UCF. Look at this hit again. Look at this again. 
Boom! That's like a 300-pound defensive lineman taking out that little scrawny quarterback. <laughs> That's a blindside hit if you ever saw one. He did not see it coming. Now, you know who that quarterback was? That was Joe Burrow, who ended up winning the Heisman the following year and got drafted number one. Now, if you go do your research, you'll find out that hit turned Joe Burrow into a Heisman candidate. Like, no joking, like, go look it up. <laughs> but he got knocked on his duff. But you know what happened? He got back up and won the game. <laughs> he broke UCF's 27-game win streak, man. I don't like Joe Burrow. <laughs> <laughs> but you think about examples of blind sides. In our life, what, when we think of a blind side, what do we think of? Maybe we think about a car wreck, right? Someone blindsides you. You don't see it coming. Maybe you think of, you go to the doctor for a regular checkup, and he says, well, listen, I have some bad news. And you get blindsided by a bad report. You think about when you're at work, and you think you have a good, dependable job, all your bills are being paid, and then all of a sudden your boss comes in out of the blue and says, hey, listen, bad news, we have to let you go. And you get blindsided. You didn't see it coming. Maybe you have a child and they're a straight A, straight A's and B's, honor roll type student, then they come home and they have an F on the report card and you're like, what? You never saw it coming. You have a loved one and they pass away before it's their time. No one sees it coming, but you feel the shock from it. I think we could all agree we don't like blindsides, do we? But why is it that we don't like blindsides? If I had to guess, and this is in your notes, I would say we hate blindsides because you and I, we love control. We love to be able to see what's coming down the highway so we can prepare ourselves emotionally for it. I mean, think about it. I mean, would you like to be able to know when your car is going to break down ahead of time? That'd be pretty nice, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't you love to know if your tire is going to be flat like ahead of time so you can prepare for it? Yeah, we don't like blind sides. We love having the control of knowing what's coming down the pike so we can prepare for it. But we know that's not how life works, is it? But isn't there something about the unknown, the blind sides of life? that can cause us to live in fear instead of faith? You think about the anxiety it causes us when we're about to start a new job. Like, ooh, I hope this works out. <laughs> hope my boss isn't a jerk like my last one. <laughs> you think about the anxiety maybe you have if you're a business owner and you're bidding on a big contract that could change everything. Am I gonna get it or not? Maybe you got a kid on the way and you're like, oh, you just feel that nervousness come inside you. Maybe you're in a relationship. You don't know where it's going. You know, there's something about the blind sides of life, the unknown, the stuff that we can't see. It can easily cause us to be filled with anxiety and fear instead of faith. And so we like to villainize the blind side. We act like the, the big villain in the room is, is the blind side. But there's a question I want you to ask yourself today. And your notes is simply, what if we find the path to God's purpose for our life after the blind side? What if there's something after the hurt, after the pain, after the thing we never saw coming? What if there's something that God wants to use in the aftermath that's going to propel us into a new stage of life that we never saw coming, that's going to connect us to God's purpose for our life? So with that being said, we're going to finish up the story of Joseph today, and we're going to see how we have a God who is acting on our behalf. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 41. And while you turn to that, let me catch you guys up real quickly where we're at. So last week, we learned how Joseph was promoted to the number two position in all of Egypt. This crazy set of events. But now that he's at number two, the Pharaoh has given him the chief job of preparing for an extreme famine that's coming on the kingdom. In fact, when we look at scripture, we see that Joseph did a really good job. In fact, they had seven years of bumper harvest before the seven years of famine. And the scripture says that Joseph and his management team, they were able to store up so much 
crops, so much grain that they could not even keep track of it. That's pretty incredible. And sometimes I think, you know, maybe Joseph was around so many farmers, that's where we get the song, Cotton Eye Joe. Like, where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Cotton Eye Joe. You know, like Egyptian cotton. Yeah, I'm sorry, that was a low bar, wasn't it? Yeah. But anyways, we see that Joseph, he's been put in charge of collecting crops to prepare for the seven years of famine. And let's check out the story and see what happens, starting in verse 53. It says, The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was a famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. And the whole world came to Egypt to buy grain from who? Joseph. Because the famine was severe everywhere. Now when Jacob, this is Joseph's father who loved Joseph, learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, now this would have been Joseph's brothers who sold him into slavery, why do you just keep looking at each other, he continued. I heard that there is grain in Egypt, so go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Maybe you can jump ahead and see what's about to happen. I mean, this sounds like the setup for a Star Wars movie. <laughs> Got the brothers who sold Joseph into slavery, and they're having to go to Egypt to go see Joseph, the brother they sold, who's number two guy in the Egyptian empire. I think we're about to see the empire strikes back. <laughs> I mean, you can read all the chapters talking about the family reunion at home, but I'll give you a brief summary. So the brothers, they go to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, and guess what? Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. So Joseph, he has to decide, what is he going to do? So he decides, let's see if their hearts are still pure. So he puts them through a set of tests and finds out that their hearts have changed. And so Joseph, he has all of his brothers. They come into, they have, he has them brought into his house. He says, hey, listen, I need to tell you something. I can imagine Joseph's brothers being like, hey, what's he about to tell us what's going on? He goes, hey, I'm your brother. Now, at this point, the story gets really awkward. Am I the only one who likes to laugh at awkward situations? So Joseph, he tells him, hey, guys, I'm your brother, the one you sold into slavery. And then Scripture says that Joseph proceeded to start wailing. Like, there are all of these emotions he's been carrying. It seems like they all come out at once. Like, like, I imagine it's like this ugly cry, like he's like snot coming all over the place, like he's <gasps> gasping for breath. <laughs> it's this deep emotional moment. In fact, Scripture says that it was, he was wailing so loudly that the servants in the house started gossiping about him. Like, yo, what's going on with Joseph out there? They're like telling like Pharaoh's servants and everything. But then it gets more awkward. Because here Joseph is just wailing, pouring out his heart before his brothers. And scripture says his brothers were petrified. They were so petrified that they couldn't even talk. I imagine a few of them probably emptied out their colons right there on the spot. <laughs> so here's Joseph, oh my brothers, I miss you. And their brother's like, oh no, we're dead. But anyways, the dust settles, and they come together to have this beautiful moment. But then Joseph tells them something that is the crux of today's message. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says that you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And what we can see from this is that we have a God who, who doesn't cause evil. God's not going to cause people to do evil towards you. But we have a God who knows that the evil is going to happen. And so as long as we stay faithful to him, God's invisible hand is moving in the background, setting into motion what needs to happen in order for a door to open for good to come out of evil that people have done towards us. Do you understand? Say yes. But Joseph couldn't see it. You and I would not have seen it. But God knew. And I can imagine when Joseph is in the pit, when he's been betrayed by his brother, he's been betrayed by his master's wife, I can imagine him thinking, God, where are you? God, why are you not showing up? God, life is so hard right now. I don't see a way out of this. And I think there's something relatable about that. 
I think it's very easy for people like you and I to get into a place where we say, God, this is so tough. God, this hurts so bad. God, I need you now. Where are you? When is life going to get better? I just want to give up and stop trying. Being totally blind that God is doing something already. That God is watching. Are we going to stay faithful? Are we going to keep our head up? Are we going to keep moving forward? And when we do, God puts his hand on that and blesses it. And God starts moving in the background and starts setting into motion a new door that's going to welcome us into God's purpose for our lives. Or in your notes, you can think about it like this, that God can turn your blind side into your greatest potential. Now, that's not how we think about blind side, is it? When we think about blind sides, we think about the hurt. We think about the rejection. We think about the betrayals and, and how much it pains us. But what God sees as people doing evil against us, God also sees as an opportunity to bring you into a new stage of life. I want you to think about the story of Joseph. What would have been Joseph's dream when he was in the prison? It would have been to be free. But what was God's plan for him? God's plan was for him to be elevated to a position where he could literally save millions of lives during the famine. Have you ever thought that maybe that's how God works with my life as well? Have you ever thought that maybe, just maybe, if I follow God's calling, if I stay faithful to his plan in the pit, what if God's plans, what if what God has in store for me and my family is greater and carries more significance than anything I can do on my own? And if that's true, then we'd be fools to not pursue God and his calling. I mean, how many people want to get to the end of their life and know that they live their life to its most significant potential? I mean, all of us, right? But what if God, the way that God's going to get us there is by turning the evil that other people did towards us around? What if there's something that God is trying to teach us in the pit, through the hurt, what if there's something that God's going to use from that? Not that God causes it, but there's something that God can use from it that's going to prepare you for a better tomorrow. And what does that better tomorrow look like? I think it's beyond anything we can know here on this earth. I'll tell you, this is what I think is going to happen. When you and I, you know, as long as we believe in Jesus, put our faith in him, when we get to heaven, this is what I think is going to happen. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to see how every little good deed, every single time we still chose to stay faithful instead of give up, every single time we chose to do the right thing, even if it hurts us, that we're going to be able to see how those little actions had a ripple effect that brought people to heaven. Listen, I'll be honest, that's what I'm looking forward to most that I get to heaven. <laughs> the first question I'm going to ask is, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? But the second question I'm going to ask, <laughs> but the second question I'm going to ask is, I want to see the people who I helped bring to heaven. Because we all know we can't bring stuff to heaven, but we can bring other people. So I want to see who it is that God allowed my good deeds and my faithfulness to impact. Anybody with me on that? I think that'd be a beautiful thing. So what are we going to do about this? What's the application we can pull from this today? And as we wrap up our series, what I want us to do is I want us to be able to put all the puzzle pieces together. But I think there's a great verse. This is a very popular verse that I think all of us should be able to memorize. And this comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. This is the New Testament. Paul encourages the church it says and we know not that we think we know that in all things not some of the things but we know in all things that God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose I believe this is the promise that we see in the life of Joseph 
we do the right thing. We keep our love towards God. We stay faithful towards God. We don't turn our back in God when things get hard. And God says, all right, I'm going to put my hand on that, and you're going to see an incredible move of my hand in your life because all things work for the good of those who love him. So I'm going to ask that the worship team come back up. And I want to show you how these four puzzle pieces come together. These are the four puzzle pieces that we put together when we find ourselves in a pit to get out of the pit so that we can walk in what God has for us. What are the four pieces of the puzzle? Well, the first piece we talked about in week one, when you're in a pit, you got to be honest with yourself. Stop playing the blame game. Stop pointing the finger at other people and say, look at your own face in the mirror and say, what is it that I did that was wrong so I don't find myself in the same pit for the same reason? And when you start asking yourself, why am I doing this, really, you're going to have to come to terms. But the beautiful part is, it lays the foundation for us to grow. Why am I doing this, really? Be honest with yourself. Then the second piece of the puzzle that is my dad talked on is don't forget who you are. It's very tempting when you're in the pit, when you're doing the right thing, and life starts ganging up against you. It's easy to choose the easy way out, even if it means sinning. But in week two, we learned about how even when things get tough, you do the right thing, even if it hurts. You honor God, God's going to honor you. In week three, last week, we talked about how when you're in the pit, we're going to live in faith and not defeat. See, the enemy, he wants to get you down and keep you down. But as Christians, we're going to keep our faith in God. We're going to rise up and we're going to keep doing the right thing. And we're going to believe that there is a better day tomorrow. That God has something better in store. And then today, the last piece of the puzzle is we're going to overcome the blind side. We're not going to allow the blind sides of life to keep us down. When we overcome the blind side, what we are saying is simply, God, I can't see what you're doing, but I believe that your hand is at work for my good. And so I'm going to continue to trust in your plan. I'm going to continue to do the right thing. Because although I can't see what you're doing, I know that you are a good, loving, faithful father. You think about in the example of Joe Burrow. The quarterback who got blindsided. He could have used that hit as an excuse to stay down and say, Coach, listen, this is just a bowl game. It's not the national championship. I'm just going to stay it out the rest of the game. He would have had every reason to do that. But instead, he got back up. And it propelled him into the next season where he became the Heisman winning quarterback in the number one pick in the NFL draft. He was knocked down, but he got back up. Think of the example of Rocky Balboa. Gosh, man, how many movies do they make of him? Oh, my goodness. Talking about a dude who kept getting knocked down and down and down and down and down again. Adversity after adversity. But he never stayed down. He would rise back up. And he won. Life can feel like it knocks us down again and again and again. But God reminds us, Although you may be down, you are not out. And although you may have got blindsided, God is still working in the background. He's going to twist and turn that evil into your good. So what we're going to do to wrap up service, I want to, we're going to sing that second song, but I want to tell you a story real quick. Overcoming the blindside. Not allowing that blind side to keep you down. Back in 2012, 2013, sometime around there, my mom was a teacher. She taught at a private school, and for no reason, she didn't do anything wrong, they let her go. Lost her job. During that time, the economy was not doing well. And if you may remember, the school board, they had a hiring freeze. They would not hire any new teachers, only full-time subs. And my mom found herself where she'd been fired from her full-time teaching position. Now she's looking for a teaching job and there's nothing available. And this is in a time when my parents, they were 
I mean, rubbing nickels, stretching that nickel till the buffalo hollers. I mean, it was tight. It had been very easy for my mom to say, I give up. Life is not fair. God, where were you? But she went out, got herself back on her feet, got a teaching job by subbing. And she would go around and to different public schools. And you want to know something? Because of my, my, God did not cause my mom to get fired. But God knew it was going to happen. And would you know that the reason that Family Life Church was built here was because my mom subbed at Liberty Middle School. See, we were not looking in this area at all to build. But one day, my mom went to my dad and said, hey, I think we need to look in this area for property. My dad was like, nah, I've been out there. It's been years, but there's nothing out there. Why this country? You know, we're we're going to stay in the city. My mom's like, no, Charles, let's go. You need, you need to go out there. There's a lot of homes. I know it's been 20 years since I've been out there, but I tell you, there's nothing out there. Charles? Okay. And God allowed for this church to be built right here. Now, how many people are grateful at Family Life Church? How many people say Family Life Church has impacted their family or their lives? And the reason we're here is because God knew. God didn't cause evil, but God knew that it was going to be an opportunity for many lives to be blessed. Just because the devil has you down, just because someone has done evil against you, just because you find yourself at rock bottom in a pit, it doesn't mean that God's done with you. In fact, God may be just starting with you. That there is a better tomorrow when we live in faith and we trust in God, that God's going to turn to evil for good. So I'm going to ask if everyone can stand up, and we're going to sing this second song. That is a declaration of faith that God is turning what other people meant for evil for our good. Come on, church, let's sing this together. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. How many people believe that this morning? You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good yes you turn it for good come on church sing it out you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good. Come on, all the praise to Jesus this morning. It's all about you, Jesus. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on in faith, let's sing it. Sing it, church. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. 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 Come 
on. Let's just give Jesus some praise in this place. God, we praise you. We give you all the glory. We give it all to you. While we were singing, I just felt like the Spirit was speaking. There's some battles people are going through right now. There's some marriages that are on the line. There's some people going through some health battles. The song says, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory because the battle belongs to you, Lord. I just feel like somebody needs to know this morning. Give it to God. God can do abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. Give the battle to God. The battle has been wearing you down. You find yourself holding on. But slowly but surely, your spirit's being crushed. Give it to God. Stop trying to do it on your own. Let me pray for you this morning. God, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you that you have a good plan for our lives and that you are a father who loves us so much that he would send his son Jesus to die for us. Help us to trust in you. Help us to rest in your arms, to not try to do it all by our own strength, but through your spirit, God. So we give it all to you. In your precious name we pray. Everyone said, amen. If you guys could just take a seat. We have a one minute video we wanna show you. And this is a organization that we're gonna be serving with later this month for our serve day. And we just wanna show you one of the programs that they offer to their residents. Today we're taking apart computers so we can recycle all the parts. And uh, Justin just took the metal pieces off and he's taking all the wires out. Once he takes all the wires out, he'll have room to start unscrewing other pieces out. Yeah, we'll cut that. So all the pieces, we have to make sure the motherboard's out, and we have all the pieces that Justin finds all the pieces in these buckets so we can separate them so we know um, what is what when we go to um, hopefully get some money from the recycling parts of this computer. Amen. So for those guys that haven't heard, we're going to be partnering with an organization called Transitions Life Center um, and on July 23rd. And this is a faith-based nonprofit who serves adults with special needs who have graduated out of the public services at Hillcrest. And so this is an incredible organization. And we're going to be going out there on July 23rd. We're going to be doing some labor jobs to help at their facility, to help their building, um, to just help make sure it's going to be around for years and years to come. And we have a sign-up sheet actually at our next steps table where you can let us know you're coming and we can look forward to having you there. And in your notes, you should have got one of those little inserts as well that has more information about it. Um, but one thing I'm really excited about is the residents, they have multiple different programs that they can do. And, and some of them are little crafts that they make and they go to fairs and shows and it gives them a chance to sell their crafts and it gives them a sense of ownership and entrepreneurship. And so this is a great organization that helps adults with special needs reach their fullest potential. And, and I'm hoping in the, in the next two weeks, we're going to be able to have some of them bring their crafts and we're going to be able to have a little shop here where we can buy some of the crafts that they made. I think that'd be cool. Don't you guys think that? You know, and I think that's so cool. And, and one thing I love about our church is that we have a slogan that we are for Ocala. We are for Ocala. We want to leave the four walls of this church and show the love of Jesus in our community because our God is for Ocala. And so we want to thank you for your partnership with us at Family Life Church to allow us to do this. 
But let me encourage you, let's go out there, let's bless these residents, and let's bless this organization and show that love of Jesus. Jesus, amen? amen. All right, if everyone could please stand. Man, up, down, up, down. It's like a Catholic church now. Woo. We're going to do communion next. Nice. All right, so hey, for our after party, for our after party, we are celebrating July 4th. We got some snow cones to beat the heat. And so you guys saw that as you were coming in. That's outside. So we want to encourage you to go grab one. It's free. And uh, we'll see you guys here next Sunday for our new series. God bless. You're now dismissed. <laughs>